Okay, well, it's wonderful to be back here. It's exciting to have a new venue and to know that um, we don't have to uh, come to a screeching halt when buildings change. And I'm really excited that the audience stayed in, uh, it, intact, even though we're in this uh, public health emergency. So thanks, everybody, for being here. I have no financial disclosures. So I, I've been working in the area of language research now for several decades. And um, I've really um, seen lots and lots of circumstances where children have challenges in learning language. I've worked with kids who have uh, deafness and children who have hearing loss. And I'm getting echoes. Is that a problem? Um, yeah. All right, we'll go back. Okay, we'll go back here. Is that still okay in the back? Yeah. Um, but there, there have been some unique situations that I've had working with children with autism, and I wanted to tell you one story to set the stage for this talk. So um, I was in an inclusion classroom. There were children, about uh, maybe six children, sitting around a table. And the teacher was going to do a game with colored balls of clay and sharing. So she reached into a bucket that had these colored balls of clay. And she pulled out two and said to child number one, which one do you want, the blue one or the pink one? And the child went, pink. And she said, pink it is. And she handed the child the ball. She reached into the, the bucket and pulled out two for the second child. She said, child number two, which one do you want, the green one or the, or the black one? And the child said, green. She said, green it is. And she gave the child the green ball. She reached into the bucket. She pulled out two more. Um, and she said to child number three, which one do you want, the red one or the orange one? And the child went, red. And she was about to give the child the red one when a hand from an adult who I hadn't even been paying attention to came across the child like this, blocking his mouth. And this adult said, I. And the child's whole affect change, and the child goes, I. And the adult says, want. And the child repeats, want. And the, the adult said, what color did I say, red? And the child said, red. And I was stunned that um, that was the way that this adult, well-meaning, well-educated, prepared, thought that you should teach children language if those children had autism. And this bothered me for several years. And recently, I just felt like I needed to move forward and understand whether my instincts that that wasn't such a good technique were right. Um, I had inspirations in, in clinic because I would see that same kind of prompting and excessive um, repetition of um, you know, of these stock phrases and, and short sentences. And I would try interacting with the children, and I could see them begin to learn, sometimes in our very assessment session. So I decided I needed to do something, and that was really look into the literature and maybe delve into doing some change in how we teach children with autism language. So with that in mind, here are the learning objectives for this talk. By the conclusion of the talk, I hope that you're all going to be able to define uh, language nutrition and discuss the components of it, discuss methods for assessing the language environment of children, contrast language nutrition for children who are typically developing and children with autism or other developmental disabilities, evaluate the impact of language nutrition on language development in autism, and then have a, a start at least at advising parents of children with autism about how they can talk to their children. Here is the take home message. Nutrition is very important for physical development and health. Language nutrition is very important for language development and language health. And language is, uh, nutrition is as important for language health and language development with children with autism as it is with healthy, typically developing children. Okay, so now let's see if I can convince you of those take home messages. So first of all, let me tell you what I mean by language health. So the evolutionary psychologists tell us that people have been talking for someplace between 70 and 200,000 years. And it is pretty clear that language has been very important in how the human um, society has taken shape. 
We can not only think about hypothetical or think about the future, we can talk to others about hypothetical and the future. And in so doing, we can begin planning and organizing. In the old days, that might be to uh, kill the woolly mammoth, and these days it might be to put men on the moon. So um, this has always been really important. At the same time, there's always been options for people if language was not a strong suit of theirs. You could work as a farmer or as a sailor or as a carpenter, and you could be very, very successful. But as we enter the 21st century, that's really beginning to change. So sailors need to learn how to use GPS, and farmers too, and they, they learn how they can differentially water their crops for better yield. And carpenters may have more sophisticated tools with computer generation, and so they're gonna have to read manuals and, and maybe even you know, change programs. So language now in the 21st century is, has taken on a much more important role at it's becoming much more important in education. Literacy, which is the outgrowth of oral language, is so critical to success in school, and it's also really important to success um, in occupation. And that's as true for individuals with disabilities as it is with individuals with no apparent disabilities. So the job options for an individual with, let's say, autism are far greater if that, if that individual is a competent communicator and knows language than for a person who remains nonverbal. So we know that the, the path to language health begins very early in life, and there's a sequence, so here it is um, kind of schematically organized. There are certain things that come early, like recognizing names, then there's gestures. Children begin to communicate with their hands and their body. Sometimes, usually around the first year, there's words, and then the vocabulary grows. Then words come together, and then pretty soon, children can string together many sentences and carry on conversations, and then use this language for reading. Now, what's important to notice on this slide is not just the sequence, but each of the bars is quite um, stretched. There's a range, there's variation in how quickly children learn these skills and when the skill comes under their control in their lifespan. And you know, it's a little bit like height curves. You can look at curves at how quickly children do some of this and you'll find that in cross-sectional data there are quick learners and um, less quick learners. So the, this is a slide about the size of vocabulary as measured by a parent report measure called the MacArthur Bates. And this had about almost 5,000 children um, feeding this, this data set. And you can see that the children in the kind of pinkish color are the ones uh, contributed to the fast path up there. And the ones with purple um, were uh, contributing to the, the lower 10th percentile. So wide variation in the rate at which children learned um, language. And like the height curve, this was generated on cross-sectional data, but it can also be pretty useful for longitudinal data. So these are longitudinal data, slightly different method, but child age on the x-axis and number of different words that were recorded during a laboratory session on the y-axis. And you can see that there are um, children like this who are kind of quick off the block and stay ahead of the pack. And then there are children who are slow developers, slow to get going, um, and then uh, take off. So there's wide variation in how quickly children learn this important skill that's taking them toward language health. Now, what contributes to the variation in the rate of development of language? Well, there's lots of things. The child, of course, brings something to the language learning situation. Certain children have more challenges based on, we're not exactly sure what, maybe structures or connectivity in the brain. But there are a lot of factors that also come from the environment that we know have been associated with rates of development. Things like caregiver education, family income, um, and, uh, um, and also maternal depression. And we know that these things are all interconnected. So 
uh, caregivers who have a good education are often able to get better jobs. They can uh, bring in more income and live in communities with better schools and create a um, healthier, maybe literacy rich home environment. Now, I want to now turn from language health to language nutrition. So, what all of those different factors boil down to is what is the language environment for the child who is learning language. And the term language nutrition um, brings together other terms that have been used, used in the literature. One's been called baby talk, and that, that term usually re, um, relates to the very early stages of talking to children where um, adults and other children for the uh, record use exaggerated intonation and slower pace um, and a slightly uh, modified vocabulary in order to gain the child's um, attention and also to promote their learning. Infant directed speech is a little bit more general um, and includes um, other features that go into the child, uh, into the speech that parents use with infants. Of course, the um, Customizing to the learner doesn't stop with infancy, so another term in the literature is child-directed speech, and sometimes it's just called input or environmental input. I want you to think of all of those as um, the language nutrition for a child. This idea that the language environment or language nutrition is important for language health and language development was really promoted by a very influential book called Meaningful Differences, published by um, Hart and Risley in 1995. And what these two researchers did was they took a huge sample of 42 children. They were carefully selected so that they um, were a certain age. They were between seven and nine months at enrollment. And the, they were selected so they would probably be available for the full three years of the study. And they were also carefully selected to represent different socioeconomic strata. So there were upper middle, uh, upper class, middle class, lower class, and families on welfare. And these researchers put a, um, a recording system on the dining room table and collected about an hour a day of input and then transcribed all that and began um, trying to understand variation in the environment and then also tested the children at age three to look at variation in the child outcome. And so the findings, um, the first thing is almost everything a kid says um, was, was available on the tapes that the, um, that the researchers collected. So that is the kind of clear evidence that children are learning primarily from um, the people around them. There were dramatic differences in the size of the vocabulary at age three, not unlike, um, even in this small sample, not unlike the slides I had shown you. There were dramatic um, differences in the parent input. There was a very strong association between how many words parents presented to the children around the dining room table and how much the child had learned by three years of age. And the sad fact was that the middle class um, and upper middle class families presented many, many more words to their children and the children were much more successful in learning language. And by extrapolating from one hour a day um, recording to a 14 hour a day um, being awake to seven days a week to three years, um, the researchers established that there was a 30 million word gap between the highest SES families and the welfare families. And that was a really shocking um, demonstration of how vastly different the language environment or the language nutrition for children can be. Now, if you go to the literature now and you Google um, Hart and Risley and 30 million word gap, you'll see that there's a big debate. Oh, it's not 30 words, it's 6 million words. The, the basic fact that um, certain families pre, you know, uh, present a very rich language nutrition and other families a less rich language nutrition has not really been challenged. So let's think, what, comp what, compromise, or no, what composes um, language nutrition environment? 
what comprises, there you go. Okay, so there are three elements to language nutrition that I want to emphasize. The first is the quantity of the language. That's what we've just been talking about with Hart and Risley. How many words are there in the environment? So it's total number of words and there's strong associations of language outcome like we just talked about. There's also gestures which can be um, extremely communicative. So that goes under the quantity. The second element is quality. And this is quality of the linguistic input or quality of the language nutrition. And this could be the number of different words that families use, the sentence complexity, the number of questions like who, what, where questions, and talking not only about the present, but the past and the future. So those get lumped under the quality of the language. And the last um, component of language nutrition is the quality of the verbal interaction. So these, these uh, words and uh, sentences can be delivered in ways that are warm and responsive to the child, that are expansions from what the child already said, or they can be offered in ways that are uh, more adult-driven um, and maybe come out of the blue for the child. So they can reflect a joint engagement about a single topic, or they can be dispersed, dis, you know, dispersed in, and all over the place. Sometimes parents are quite intrusive. They, they're the ones who um, generate what the next topic of conversation will be, or very directive, telling the child what to do, pick this up, do this. So all of these represent components of language nutrition. So now I might need some help getting this video to run. So let's take a look at this. Some of you may have already seen this video. Let's take a look at this video um, as an example of language nutrition. Let her rip. Oh, need sound. Yes. Did you understand it though? Yeah. No. Okay. All right. Come on. Oh, no, not, not this one. This is, this is the grand finale of this. Okay, the last one? Yeah, that's the last one. That's what I was wondering. I don't know what they're going to do next season because they did some stuff this time. Exactly what I was thinking. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, don't bring that again. You know what I'm saying? Don't do the same stuff. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's like that, yeah. I love you too. Yeah. Like go somewhere else with that, but don't break here, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> That's what I said. And he was like, ah, you know what I'm saying? And I was like, what in the world? But don't do that here, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> really? I thought the same thing. <laughs> We think a lot alike, huh? Okay. Bye, bye, bye. Okay. <laughs> That's crazy. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay, one or two comments. What did, what you're all smiling and warm, feeling cozy. Tell me one or two things that you really loved about that video. Just scream them out. Warm, warm and responsive. Yeah, what else? Fun, really great. Interactive, right? Lots of gestures, verbal and gestures putting together, right? Kid driven, right? The kid says, Edward, and he goes, yeah, I think the same thing. We think alike, don't we? So that is, I think, just like a quintessential example of language nutrition. Now, just want to be clear that language learning opportunities vary across the day. You know, you have opportunities in the morning when kids are getting up or getting dressed, and they go all through the day, even until bedtime. And the way we used to assess this was some kind of old school methodology, like a tape recorder or, or um, handwritten notes when children came into the laboratory. This is my old research. I actually used video, but... Um, but I just want you to know that there are some new school ways of doing this, and one is called the Lena device, and that's the picture here on the right. And this is a special recorder with an algorithm that gives you approximate word counts for language that's near and close to the child. 
Um, and the child wears it in specialized clothing, and you can get about 16 hours of um, home recording to really get a feel for what's happening in the child's natural environment. And there's lots that we're learning about language nutrition when we see the outputs of this. So here's hours of the day across the bottom, and this is the adult word count in 10 minute uh, little dollops, and you can see that uh, in the morning there around breakfast and probably maybe around school, there's lots and lots of input to the child. And then you see that it drops down between 12 and, and 2. That's probably nap, right? And then it kind of goes up. And then there's that big old peak close to 8 p.m. Now, if you look at another output, from the, um, from the same Lena device. This one is called conversational turns. And this is when the child and the parent go back and forth and back and forth. And you can see in that morning segment, oh, there's lots of back and forth and back and forth. There's the nap, there's nothing back and forth. Um, and then at 8 p.m., notice, there's not a lot of back and forth there either. That's probably because that's the reading, and that's an adult taking a little bit more responsibility for the language input. So there's lots of interesting things we can do with Alina. And I should tell you that some speech and language pathologists are using this now as a clinical tool, and there's ways that families can also use it to see about language environment, let's say, for example, if they're not home with their child. So what I want you to know is that language nutrition has been found to be a key predictor of language outcomes in a wide variety of studies in a wide group of children, different language groups, children who were born preterm, children who have uh, hearing loss, um, Down syndrome, and specific language impairment. So now let's start thinking about how this might work in the um, circumstance of children with autism. We know that this has really captured our national attention, um, but I think this aspect of language learning has not. So the first thing is I want to convince you that the, um, there is variation in the rates of language learning and individuals with autism. Now, I know this group isn't so surprised by that, but I just want to make the point that there are, diff that there are different um, curves as you go across time. And this is a very wide age span, right, from infancy all the way to adulthood. The red is the norm normative or typical development. And you can see some individuals have very close to typical de um, developmental status, and some have a more marked delay. I think the other thing that you can see is the, the more of the variation is taking place in those early years, let's say around um, two to three, and by the time kids are getting to be about six, their rate of development doesn't change very much. Now that is not to say that their language doesn't change. You'll notice that they st still keep getting um, a higher uh, age equivalent when using the violin, which is this study, but their rate of change um, gets stable. So if we're gonna do anything with language nutrition, best hunch is we wanna do it when there's a lot of variation and movement, and that would be in the early years. So um, I worked last year on a scoping review. I learned about a scoping review from my wonderful colleagues, and um, this is an opportunity to look broadly across the literature, not necessarily to reduce everything to a systematic review, but to, um, to kind of look for trends and, and truths in the literature across a wide range. And we did a scoping review because we wanted to see how um, language nutrition varied in different groups, and we chose three groups, children born preterm, children with um, intellectual disability, and children with autism. So I want to just give you one other kind of set of basic concepts before I tell you what we learned in the literature. So you can think about uh, language nutrition as prevention, prevention of the more severe language disorder. But I want to remind you that there's three levels of prevention in a public health um, approach. The first is primary prevention, where you give um, the treatment to an asymptomatic individual and they never get the disease. And of course, for those of us in pediatrics, we know the quintessential example of that is vaccination. Ideally, you give measles vaccine and the child never gets measles. But there's also secondary and tertiary prevention. And you may remember that secondary prevention is that you give the treatment to an individual at an early stage, 
And then that individual develops a very mild form of the condition. Um, and that would, that's an example of like mammography. You know, we wait and you know, we get mammography, but we're not anticipating like with vaccine. We, when we see a, a mass, we have to act on it and that leads to better outcomes. And tertiary prevention is that we know the individual has a condition in this case, it could be autism, but they get the treatment and they have better functional outcome. And I think the quintessential example of this is early intervention. So if we have an individual who has uh, Down syndrome or other intellectual disability and we give them early intervention, we know that they may still have cognitive impairment, but we really think that they'll be more successful functionally um, than if they hadn't had the early intervention. So when we're thinking about language nutrition, I think we're sort of focusing, especially for autism, we're focusing on secondary and tertiary prevention and not primary prevention. So now I wanna show you a little snippet of a, a father and son. Um, at, the boy's about five and has autism. So let's see if this all works. What else is in this box, Danny? Take it. Take another toy out. Quack with a duck. Quack with a duck. Well, big birds. Big birds. What does he look like? A duck to you, huh? Can, can you make the big? Can you make the bird stand up? Yeah. Yeah, boy. Okay. What else is in that box? Tell me something else. You have another toy in there you want to play with? What's that? What's that toy? What's truck. that called? Truck. A truck. That's a truck. Do you like that truck? Oh. What color is that truck, honey? Red. It's a red truck. Can you make the truck roll on the table? Roll on the table. Right. That's good. What color? What color are the tires? What color are the tires, honey, on the truck? Wheels. The wheels. What color are the wheels? White. What else do you want to play with in there? Dan. Dan. Here. What else do you want to play? Use it. Uh, like your nose. What else do you want to play with in there? Is that your favorite? What are you going to give Big Bird a hug? Give me a kiss. Give Big Bird a kiss. Oh, that's good. That's good. What color are Big Bird's feet? Danny? Orange. Orange feet. That's Crawling. Very you're, make, you're making Big Bird crawl. That's very good. Oh. What? You're giving Big Bird a kiss. Can you make Big Bird drive the truck? Drive the truck? Go ahead. Show me how you can do that. Make Big, make Big Bird drive the truck for me, okay? Honey, can you make Big Bird drive on the truck? Big Bird on the truck? Big Bird on the truck. Okay, what truck is that? What color is that truck? It's a blue truck. Okay, so um, obviously you can't compare any parent to the other um, videotape language nutrition. But what are a couple of things that you notice in this? Obviously this is a father who loves his kid. He's proud of his child's accomplishments. He's, he's, the, he's actually the main parent in this particular um, case. So what are some of the things you noticed in his interaction with his son? He, he, he's doing a lot of the work, isn't he? And that gets called, if you're coding in an experiment, that gets called intrusive or directive, right? He's not following up on ways that he could really follow up. Like, you know, the kissing, the, you know, the kissing the bird could have been an opportunity to go on and on about kissing and loving and hugging and, and so forth, but it was truncated because he was directing the next thing. Now, you know, maybe if he was at home and he didn't have our video cape, uh, you know, camera running, he would have been a little bit more responsive. But it's just to point out how directive. Um, any other things that you want to notice? Yeah, much more constrained, right? <coughs> yeah. And he's, he's proud and he's warm, but I think he's, um, he, he's not specific in his warmth, is he? He's not like, oh, you, you know, you're showing Big Bird love. You're really hugging hard. You know what I mean? He's just kind of moving on. So um, I think 
these are some of the things that we would be looking for um, when we think about language nutrition for children with autism. So in our scoping review, we asked three questions. The first question was, compared to language nutrition in healthy and typically developing children, what's the language nutrition like for children with autism and other um, intellectual or, or uh, delay conditions? Question number two, what is the strength of the association between features of the language input and the language outcome? Is it as strong in this population? And the third is to what extent can we intervene to change or improve both language nutrition, but more importantly, language outcomes or language health? So compared to language nutrition, uh, comparing the language nutrition of typically developing children and children with autism, here's a summary slide of what we found in the scoping review. So we asked about quantity on the top, quality, and the quality of the verbal interaction. And interestingly, we've, the, you know, the, the literature says there are not that many differences in terms of adult word count or in terms of the number of different words as an example of quality. But what you see when you can compare the autism to the typically developing um, children is that the typically developing children get more questions and the children with autism fewer questions. Sentence complexity is um, higher for children who are typically developing and less complex for children with autism. And like we just saw and we just talked about in that video, more direction toward um, the typical, to the um, children with autism, less direction, more spontaneity, and allowing the child to lead on uh, the children uh, who are typically developing. Okay, and just to show you, um, you know, these different studies pick different indicators. So um, I just also wanna show you that uh, for um, children who have global delays or intellectual disabilities, similarly, not much difference in actual counts or in um, the quality of the use of descriptions, but in encouragement, which might be in our interaction or in quality, more encouraging, um, they, okay, so this, is, this may look a little bit like a confusion. They're more encouraging for the children with global delay, and that's because at the age when some of this was done, you shouldn't have to encourage kids so much. The interaction is its own encouragement, but here you have a lot like, good Danny, good Danny, you know, over and over again. And again, less direction and more direction. Okay, so then, what's the strength of association between features of the language nutrition and language outcomes? And for this, I'm gonna show you a representative study. This happened to be with um, children who had fragile X, some of whom had autism, some of whom didn't, but uh, most had global developmental delay or intellectual disability. And um, what you can see is those parents who had high and sustained responsivity had children whose rate of development was faster, and those, children, those adults who had low sustained responsivity, their children had slower rates of development. And when you look at our, um, our chart here, um, we saw that as sentence complexity went up, the child language scores went up. When commenting on what the child was paying attention to went up, the child language went up. When redirecting the child's attention was high, the child's outcome was low. It was a negative association. And I want you to pay attention to the last one. When parents use what's been called telegraphic speech, that's the I want cookie, the um, outcomes were worse for children. So the positive relations with the child language outcomes are seen for very long periods of time after the initial observations were made. So now the question is, to what extent can we change uh, or improve language nutrition and thereby in improve child outcomes? Because it could be that those associations have something to do with the child, the child pulls from the parent. So for this, I want to show you two um, meta-analyses. So this one on the left, you, you remember on these forest plots that you put the difference between the target population, in this case, children with intellectual disability and autism were grouped together. 
The, the, um, the difference between those children and typically developing children is the symbol in the middle. The lines emerging from that symbol are the confidence intervals. And if there's a positive difference, the, um, the lines stay to the right of the red line, the zero. And if there's a negative influence, the lines are to the left. So you can see when you look study by study, there's not a lot of studies that show big change, but when you add in a meta-analysis across all those studies, you get a slight advantage, the, the um, blue diamond, which is on the positive side. And here's another study. This is just um, with children with um, autism, and you see they, they had it arranged a little bit differently in their paper, but it's the same general idea. And you see, again, a little blue uh, diamond that's to the positive side, but many studies don't show an advantage. So why the modest effect sizes? Why aren't we seeing more? So one thing is that in all of these studies, children are enrolled in other services, so you have to have the language nutrition really make a contribution about uh, above everything else that the children are getting. So it's a, it's a tall order. In many of these studies, the language nutrition is very minimal. So there's very few sessions, or the parent education takes place without the child being present. And there's limited modeling and limited feedback about how the parents are doing. And I think another really important thing here is that a lot of the studies only choose one element of language nutrition, and many of them choose the quality of the verbal interaction, which is great, right? We want a fun verbal interaction like we saw in that first video. But if you don't give children meaningful um, language to hear, they have nothing to, to grow their own language from. So I think we need to think about um, interventions that have all elements of language nutrition represented. And another point is that we should be looking at what we think we can change, which is not primary autism symptoms, because that's not what we're intervening on, but rather the, um, the language outcome. So I, I'm actually beginning to pull together um, some uh, ideas for a randomized trial where we can see whether if we do language nutrition in a really meaningful way, whether we can improve the language outcomes. Um, and then, uh, then we would have stronger evidence about how to work with parents. And the ingredients that I think are going to be important are that when we talk with parents about language nutrition, we have the caregivers and the children together that, that way we can model what we mean by language nutrition. We can get going a funny, you know, fun-filled, um, responsive interaction. And we should make it as explicit as we can for parents and their child and sustain it over time. And one of the things that I'm um, hoping to do is use that Lena device to get some ideas about how parents are using language so then we can personalize the um, language nutrition for an individual family. But I think there's enough evidence in that literature that we can begin talking with parents right now about how they can improve the language nutrition for their children. So here are some general um, suggestions. One, parents should be warm and responsive, have fun, like uh, father number one. Provide the child with many words and many gestures. You know, in the early phases of language learning in a typically developing child, they might hear a word 3,000 or 10,000 times before they learn car or shoe or dog. So let's give children with autism that same opportunity. Repeat the words frequently. Follow the child's focus of attention rather than direct the interaction. Use full sentences, use appropriate grammar. They don't have to be complex sentences um, with really complicated vocabulary, but at least they should be proper English sentences so the child learns proper English sentences. Avoid excessively simplified speech, like the telegraphic speech. Avoid directing, and especially avoid prompting. I think when parents get used to prompting, it's very hard for them to fade. Model using many grammatical sentences um, and, and uh, using the words over and over in a single time. And think more about whether the child's understanding rather than whether the child can say the word. I think that if you're working with people at different stages of development, you might think about at the early stages, which in, in typically developing children is years of life, but maybe in children with autism is shifted toward older uh, years, but still early stages 
think about lots of words and warmth and responsiveness and maybe some gestures. And then as children get a little bit older or more mature, then add in a wide variety of words, longer and um, uh, more interesting grammatical sentences, more questions, and talk about past and future. Thank you all for your kind attention.